Sessions, Chapter 12, and most folks consider these three sections the easiest three sections in the book that we're going to cover, so that's a good, a good thing, a good way to finish off with stuff that's a little bit easier. <coughs> and what we are going to learn first with parametric equations is a whole new way to represent curves. And the obvious question is, what's wrong with the current way? Why can't we just use the x's and the y's that we've been using all along? All right, and the answer is, the answer is very simple. What is the equation of a line in two-dimensional space? So you could put it in slope-intercept form, or you could put it in this ABC form, the general form. Slope intercept form, you could also you know, put it in point slope form, lots of ways you could put a line. So here's my question to you. What is the equation of a line in three dimensional space? Let's see. So I think what you are suggesting, what you are suggesting, Eliana, is that we do something like that. So we, oh, I thought those were crutches for a second. No. I was like, did you hurt yourself? It's a Q. She's got a Q. I'm scared. So that's the natural question. Is that the equation of a line in three-dimensional space? If you're in three-dimensional space, you know you need another dimension. So you need a Z of some sort. And this would be the simplest equation in three-dimensional space because it's linear. Right? Linear is the simplest type of equation. So this is the simplest equation in two-dimensional space, which we represent as R2. So the simplest equation in R2 is a line, for sure. But what does that equation have for its graph? Is it really a line? In college algebra, you should have actually learned that that's not a line. What is it? I don't see any squares. Right, if, we want to get, if we want to get something that's curved, we've got to have some power. Mm -hmm. We have no power there. Everything's linear. So what is that equation? What's the graph of that equation in three-dimensional space? Woo! There's no squares. If you want something that's curved, you need squares or cubes or some power. Circle has a curve, right? The equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Eliana, what did you just say? I said, is it like a slice? And what is the word for a slice? Plane. That is a plane. So we're hosed right out of the gate. This is a plane in R3. So we're hosed. If the simplest equation in three-dimensional space yields a plane, that's a problem. Then we can't use rectangular coordinates. If we're trying to represent a line and the simplest equation gives a plane, we need another method to, to represent curves. Most of the work that we do in the world is in three-dimensional space and is following a path in space. You know, maybe it's not a straight line, maybe it's parabolic, maybe it's you know, sort of like a spiral or something. But regardless, a curve in three-dimensional space is a fundamental thing that we need to be able to represent mathematically. And so we can't do it with x, y's, and z's. That's why we go with parametric. So. <clears throat> Parametric curves, and we, we will see them, we're going to do them in two dimensions in our class. Two dimensions in our class, uh, but when you get into Calc 3, you're going to have, ooh, that's terrible. You're going to have three dimensions, and so the idea once you get into Calc 3 is that we'll have a curve that's doing something in three-dimensional space, and we want to be able to map it. 
So you, we can do that with parametric equations. What another few things that we can do, we can also figure out an orientation. So curves that are represented parametrically will have an orientation, which means as the value of t increases, what direction are the points plotted? So our parametric equations are going to have this extra variable in them called t. That's called the parameter. And the idea with parametric equations is that we create a coordinate function for each coordinate. So we'll have a coordinate function for x, a coordinate function for y, and if we are in three-dimensional space, that's where the z comes in. <coughs> if we wanted to go to three dimensions, we would have to put a third component here, z equals whatever function of t. That would all of a sudden now be a curve in three-dimensional space if you add a z equals some function of t. Now you have a curve in three space. Okay, so curve in two space looks like that. And the question is going to be, well, how do we graph these parametric curves? We don't have any intuition for graphing parametric curves because we just learned them in, in one second ago. So here's what the process will be. If we want to graph a parametric curve, what we are going to do is treat the parametric equations like a system. We're going to eliminate the t so that we generate a Cartesian equation, an x and y equation. We've been graphing x and y equations for years. We know how to graph lines and circles and parabolas and all sorts of things in x's and y's. So the idea is going to be eliminate the t, graph the Cartesian equation, figure out if there's a restriction. Well, right here we see there's a restriction on the t. t can only go 0 to pi. And then we're going to graph the parametric curve, and then we're going to find the orientation. So that's going to be our process. Let's do it. Now, when you see sines and cosines, I hope the first thing that comes into your head is the, the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. That's the first thing that should come into your head. So you know that this is true. All right. That is true no matter what t is. That's always true. Well, looking at our parametric equations, sine is equal to y. So there's y squared. Cosine is equal to x. So there's x squared. Bada bing. That is our Cartesian equation. That is the Cartesian equation. Because cosine is equal to x, so we replace the cosine with x, and we get x squared. Sine is equal to y. We replace the sine with y. We get y squared. So our whole goal is to eliminate the t. And usually with parametric equations that have sines and cosines, you're going to use some Pythagorean identity. So there it is. There is our Cartesian curve right there. The parametric curve is a subset of the Cartesian curve. It might be the entire Cartesian curve, but it might only be part of it. So the parametric curve is a subset of the Cartesian curve. So now, to figure out which subset it is, we do a table of values. So table of values. Every t value that we plug in creates an ordered pair. So if we look at our interval there, we're going 0 to pi. So let's figure out those two values first. If we plug in a 0 for t into these parametric equations, we get cosine 0 sine 0. Cosine 0 is 1, sine 0 is 0. So that is where we are when t is equal to 0. Typically, we think of t as representing time. We're thinking about what go, what, what, where do these points go as time goes by. OK, and now we plug in a pi. Plug in a pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1, sine of pi is 0, so we're at negative 1 comma 0. This is where we are when t is equal to pi. All right. Now, when we have a closed curve, we don't really know whether we went counterclockwise or clockwise. 
So we need one extra point. We're going to pick something in between 0 and pi just to confirm airtight which direction we are traveling along that circle. So we plug in pi over 2. Sure enough, we get 0 comma 1. So here is where we are at t equals pi over 2. So this is the standard parameterization of a unit circle. Just go around counterclockwise. Cosine is x, sine is y, like it always was. And there is our parametric curve. Our parametric curve is the upper half of that circle. That is the parametric curve. Now we have to indicate the orientation. Orientation is counterclockwise. It's the direction in which the points are plotted. We don't put those arrows at the end points. We put them somewhere in the middle of the curve. And that just indicates what direction the points are plotted. Good? Is that all right? Any questions that you can think of yet? So what do you think if we wanted the full circle? What, what would we let t go from? Yeah, if we go 0 to 2 pi, we'll get the whole circle. That's right. Yeah, another question? Will the x and y always be given? Most of the time. Sometimes they'll say, here's a graph, now you find the parametric equations. But usually for us, in most cases, we're given the x and the y, and we want to find the graph of it. Most of the time. Yeah. So let's look at a few more of these. Parametric equations are not unique. We will see that there are lots of different parametric representations of the same curve, which makes that mechanic a complicated. Once again, we see sines and cosines. If we want to eliminate t, that is going to be our key. Right? The Pythagorean theorem holds regardless of what you put in for the angle, as long as these two angles match, as long as what's inside the sine and the cosine are the same, that identity holds. So we look up here, and we say, oh gosh, sine of negative t is equal to y, so this is going to be y squared. Cosine of negative t is x, this is going to be x squared. So once again, we have the unit circle as our parent curve. That's going to be the Cartesian graph up there. OK. Now to figure out what subset this parametric curve is, we can do a table of values. So a little table of values goes a long way. Once again, we want, definitely want to use the end point, but we also need a point in the middle. So pi over 2 is the natural choice. You could plug in 5 or 4, whatever. <coughs> OK, plugging in t equals 0. Cosine of 0, cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0. So we're at 1 comma 0. So, oh, same place, right? Same place as the last one. Same starting point. Let's go to pi over 2. So plugging in pi over 2, cosine, for plugging in pi over 2, we get cosine of negative pi over 2, which is 0. And then we get sine of negative pi over 2, which is negative 1. So here is where we are at t equals pi over 2. And when we plug in t equals pi, cosine of negative pi, negative 1, sine of negative pi, 0. So we are, in fact, back over here when t is pi. What we're noticing is that our parametric curve is the lower half of the circle. We are also noticing that the orientation is clockwise. How do you know that the orientation is clockwise? So the orientation is the direction of increasing t. So t is 0 here, and then we're going to increase t to pi over 2, and then we're going to increase pi over 2 to pi. So it's the direction the points are plotted as t gets larger and larger. So we say the direction of increasing t is kind of how we say it. And once again, if we went 0 to 2 pi, yeah, we'd get the full circle. Full circle. Full circle. But it'd be different than the other one still because you're going in a different direction. Different direction, yeah. So you can have the same graph, but a different orientation. That's right. So 
how does the concept of orientation apply when we're not dealing with circles? You will see. We'll, so we'll see that, let's say our graph tends, it turns out to be a parabola or something, like an upside down parabola. So it might be that we're, we have an initial point here and a terminal point here, and the graph goes like that, and the points are being plotted this direction. So how would you refer to that? Is clockwise oh, no, we won't use the words clockwise and oh. counterclockwise. Yeah, well, that's why we have to have the graphical arrow that kind of tells us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Yeah, we won't be able to use clockwise and counterclockwise. Now, one other thing I want you to notice is that this T value, in these first two examples, the T value has a very obvious geometric meaning. In the first one, it was the counterclockwise rotation. That's what T represented. And in this one, the T is representing a clockwise rotation, right? It's the angle that we're rotating clockwise. There are lots of examples of parametric curves where the T value really doesn't have any obvious geometric significance. So sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Here's another one. All right, there. All right, you all try this one. So eliminate the T and graph the parametric curve with its orientation on that unit circle. So that unit circle is the Cartesian graph. See if you can find and graph the parametric curve. Does that apostrophe carry any significance? What is that? It's on the it's last page too. between the equation and the... Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It's a comma, that's what it is. Oh. It's a comma for the domain. Yeah, oh, that makes so yeah. much more sense. It's so funny when you said that. I, was I just thought you like made the same typo three times by like copy pasting or something. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a comma to distinguish the, the domain over there. Yeah, great question. It looks like a flying comma. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Good question. I should put a space there. Put a space because it does look like an apostrophe. Cosine of t is owning it. Got possession. <laughs> Any questions on coming up with the seeing that we get the same exact Cartesian? What portion of the Cartesian graph do we get? So when we go ahead and plug this in, once again we get sine squared plus cosine squared is one, so we get that. And then we create our table of values so we know exactly where we are on that circle. So our table of values, we're gonna do a T, X, Y. 0 pi over 2 and pi. Plug in 0, sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so this is 0, 1. Starting on top. Everybody agree with that first point? Bless you. Thank you. So starting at 0, 1, that's our t equals 0. And now when t is pi over 2, sine of pi over 2, Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So that puts us at 1 comma 0. So 1 comma 0. That's corresponding to t equals pi over 2. So once again, it feels like we can kind of, it feels like we kind of know what the geometric significance of the t is. Plugging in pi, sine of pi is 0. So we're at 0 comma negative 1. Something's wrong there. Something is wrong. Plugging in pi, cosine of pi. No, that's right, negative one. Just felt wrong, but it's right. Weird. Sometimes things can feel wrong, but they're right. Hopefully that was your experience on the exam. Hopefully the things that didn't feel right were actually right. Hopefully. Were there supposed to be things that didn't feel right? I mean, doing infinite series never totally feels right, does it? No. <laughs> it always feels a little shaky. 
All right, any questions? We see in this case that the geometric significance of T, clockwise angle but measured from the North Pole. How is that different from the first one? The first one we started at zero and went, we started at the right edge of the circle and went counterclockwise. So the very first one we started over there and rotated that way. And the difference with the up here, we just have these swapped. Okay. So cosine came first. So this prayer parameterization of the circle is sort of the common one. That's the standard one. X and cosine being connected and Y and sine being connected. That's the standard parameterization. That's the one that's going to be most common. And I don't know if that thing's going to open or not. If it doesn't, we can just go right to Desmos. Don't understand. If you can ask me to log in, or is it going to just work like it's supposed to? It's working for me. It did work for you? Oh, good. All right, well, then hopefully it works for me. I was at home and it was not working. Oh, good. All right. Um, so, let's make that a little bigger. So Desmos is a really great place to go if you want to uh, play around with parametric equations. So what I have over here, let's see, I guess I have to scroll over there. Okay, so uh, the domain here is going 0 to 2 pi, but what I did was throw in a slider here. And so this is going to allow us to slide through and obviously see that we're rotating counterclockwise. We're doing just the first one up there. So that's the one that's cosine comma sine. Mm -hmm. And note, all your graphing utilities have parametric. Right? And in Desmos, all you do is enter it as x comma y. And then I have some restrictions over here just because I want to be, you know, use the t as the input. Um, so then the second one that we did was let's just replace t with a negative t. And if we replace t with negative t, what we saw was the only difference was that we rotated clockwise. Obvious question here is, if you have a closed curve and you have a t uh, that's being replaced with negative t, does that always change the orientation? And the answer is no. It feels like if you plug in a negative t instead of a t, it will just change it to clockwise instead of counterclockwise. But that's not always the case. It is a lot of times, but not always. And then, so the third one we had was this one. So he, this one we started up at the North Pole, and we're going clockwise. All the way around. Can you include sound effects on our final <laughs> I can try. So now we're going to do this weird shifty one, and it's just like <laughs> clockwise, starting at the west side of the circle. So starting over there, clockwise. But you've got to plug in a few points if you really want to see what's happening, or you have to have like a really happy mouse to sort of play with it. Or you can hit the play button. Hit there, play button. You can do that too. See that's going clockwise. Oh! <laughs> now what's happening? Going backwards. I can't take it. Stop! <laughs> That's giving me a headache. That's too, too flexible. All right, let's try one of Dan's questions was, well, what if we have something that is not closed? So here we have parametric equations. And pretty darn quick to get to the Cartesian counterpart equation. All right, we're just going to do a substitution. That goes into there. We'll get the y is x squared. So that is our Cartesian graph. <clears throat> we know how to graph the parabola, graph it with dashes, because the Cartesian curve is a superset. The parametric curve is just part of it. It might be the whole thing, but we usually graph the superset with dashes because the parametric curve is going to just be part of it. All right, so now what part of it? Well, let's do our table of values. So our t, x, y, negative 2, we'll put a point in the middle for good measure. Here we don't need a point in the middle because it's not a closed curve, so there's no ambiguity. You can't say, oh, did we go clockwise or did we go counterclockwise? 
no ambiguity there. So now we're going to plug into our parametric equations. So x is just t. And then we square each one of those x values. And we see pretty clearly that negative 2, uh, t equals negative 2 put us at negative 2, 4. So there's t equals negative 2. t equals 0 put us right here at the origin. And then t equals 2 put us up there. So voila, we are dealing with this as our parametric curve. So our parametric curve is a subset of the Cartesian curve. It's not the whole Cartesian curve. It has a starting point and a stopping point. And the orientation, we can't really describe it with words very easily, but we can draw it with little arrows and we can understand from the picture that the orientation is essentially going left to right. Not bad. It doesn't feel quite as harebrained as infinite series. Now this is interesting. So that curve up there, parent curve or the Cartesian curve, y equals x squared, we're going to get the same Cartesian curve here. Right? When you substitute t squared in as x, we are in fact going to get y equals x squared again. So we're going to have two parametric curves that have the same Cartesian curve. But notice here, when we go to figure out the points that are on the curve, we end up with something slightly different. Oh, x is squared, and then y is to the fourth power. So that's going to be a, I'm squaring this yet again. So we're going to have that. So t equals negative 2 is corresponding to 4 comma 16, which is right there. So that's t equals negative 2. t equals 0 is, in fact, down there. That's fine. But isn't t equals positive 2 back up here again? So our parametric curve is just that side of the parabola, that piece of the parabola. But it doesn't have orientation the way it's presented to us. Because there is not a distinct direction of increasing t. You can kind of envision in your head that t starts at negative 2 here and it goes down, but then it hits this point and turns around and goes back up. So it's not going to have a distinct orientation. If we modified the domain, we could say from negative 2 to 0, the orientation is down, but then from 0 to positive 2, the orientation would be up, so you could break it apart. Now this brings up an important point with parametric. It is not, you do not always get what you see. Like in Calc 1, if someone said, is the function f differentiable, one strategy was to graph the function f, and if it was smooth, it was differentiable. Like you could see points where it was not differentiable. Right? You could see a corner. You could see a cusp. You could see a gap. Right? You could just physically look at the curve and decide whether it was differentiable or not. Parametric is totally different. There's some weird things that are kind of behind the scenes. So what's happening here is that this function is not going to be differentiable at that point. Because it's coming down and turning around, that point is acting just like a cusp or a corner uh, in, a, in a regular function of, uh, function of x. So when you look at that curve, it feels like, oh yeah, that's smooth, it's differentiable. But with parametric, it's not what the curve looks like, it's what the parametrization does. <clears throat> All right, so uh, another thing is if the question says, what is the arc length? What is the distance from here to here? We would need to be very careful that we chose a parametrization that didn't have overlap. If we want to find the distance from between those two points along the parabola, we have to make sure that we choose a parametrization that graphs each point exactly once, because we don't want any overlap. Like if you have a parametrization that goes around the circle twice, and the question said, what's the circumference of that circle? You don't want to you know, go around twice. 
unless they're asking for something like distance traveled and something spinning in a circle. But if they want arc length, that's not what they're asking for usually. <coughs> All right, so let's try one more. Um, here we've got our parametric equations. And I'm going to write them stacked. I find it a little easier to write it as a system because one of our strategies is to eliminate t and we treat it like a system. I find it a little easier to look at it like that. All right, so eliminate t. We can use substitution, we can use elimination, doesn't really matter. What I notice right off the bat is that this second equation is much better to use for solving for t. There's no ambiguity, there's no plus or minus a square root. So that's gonna be the easier equation to isolate t in. And then we plug it into the first equation. So that is gonna get plugged in up here for t. So if we square that amount, we get y squared over 16 plus 2. There is the Cartesian curve. Just a parabola, opening to the right, kind of flat. y squared over 16 flattens it out. And then the plus 2 shifts it to the right, two units. And I don't know why here I should go into this also. The parent curve, the, the Cartesian curve, goes on forever. That goes on forever. The parametric curve is what's going to be just part of it, typically. So the Cartesian curve should go on forever. It goes on and on and on. Then we will create a table of values to figure out what portion of the Cartesian is the parametric. And they tell us that we want our t values between negative 4 and positive 4. And we'll pick a point in the middle just for good measure. Again, you don't need to. If the curve is not closed and there's no ambiguity, you don't need to. Okay, so let's plug in the negative 4 first. 16 plus 2 is 18. And then 4 times 4 is 16. Uh, negative 16. 0, we get 2 comma 0. 4, we get 18 comma 16. Then we're going to come over here. So negative 4, 18 comma negative 16, that's right here. That's at t equals neg 4. Plugging in t equals 0 is giving us 2 comma 0, so that is t equals 0. And t equals 4 is putting us up here. So here we have our parametric curve and the orientation, the direction the points are plotted, that way. That'll be our orientation. That'll be our curve, parametric curve. Yeah? Will, you, will we always be given the graph? Or? No. Okay. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't give it to you, should I? No, I agree with you. Yeah, no. So for these ones, these ones are ones that I would expect you to be able to graph. Uh, like this thing right here. Now, where is it? There's some that are harder to graph. I don't know where they are. We'll find them. Yeah, the, the ones that I would expect you to be able to graph, parabolas and lines and circles. Nothing too complicated. An ellipse. Hopefully you can graph an ellipse. Hopefully. So will we be graphing mostly 2D? Yes, all 2D in here. Yeah, we don't go to 3D until next semester. Calc 3. Yeah, Calc 3. Uh, Calc 2 is in 2D. Calc 3 is in 3D. Mostly. Mostly. So we um, want to figure out how these parametric equations work in 2 space. 
before you go into three space. Like here, we could obviously graph in different ways. We don't have to use parametric here. In Calc 3, where you're dealing with a curve in three space, you have to use parametric. So we want to do enough of parametric here that when you get to Calc 3, it's not a huge leap. No huge leaps. All right, well, let's go and figure out this parametric curve. So it looks very circle-ish once again. And once again, we want to use our Pythagorean theorem, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. But the way the system is presented to us at first, we've got these coefficients. And so what we want to do is divide both sides by those coefficients so that we can isolate sine and cosine. That will allow us to plug into the system more easily. So we see that sine of y is, sine of t is y over 3. So this is going to be y squared over 9. And then cosine squared, cosine is x over 3. So we're going to square that. We get x squared over 9 equals 1. And if we write this, this is a circle. If we write it in its standard form, it would look like that. x squared plus y squared is 9. Circle centered at the origin, radius 3. And you're probably recognizing that, oh gosh, if that was 5, we'd have a circle of radius 5. All right, whatever that coefficient is, as long as they match. As long as they match, you'll have a circle of that radius. Is that a not a not so subtle match for the test? Indeed. Okay. And then let's do our table of values. So the table of values, we'll have t, x, and y. And we're going 0 to pi over 2 this time. So we're going to go 0, pi over 4, and pi over 2. We want to have a point in the middle, once again, because this is a closed curve. Plug in at 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we're going to get 3, comma, 0. So that's our initial point right here. <coughs> and you can kind of see where it's going. We see that cosine is in the x position, sine is in the y position. That's our traditional position, x with cosine, y with sine. That's going to pull us around the circle counterclockwise. So if we plug in pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we're going to end up with 0, 3. So that's where we are at pi over 2. And we can see very clearly the geometric significance of t is the counterclockwise angle. And if we plug in pi over 4, cosine and sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. But then we have to multiply by 3. So we're going to get 3 root 2 over 2, 3 root 2 over 2. And that is dead center right there. So our parametric curve is that, and our orientation is indicated. When we're grappling, do we need the t equals on the points or no? You don't have to. You don't have to. So we get a quarter circle. So it's really easy to restrict the parametric curve. It's a lot harder with a, with a Cartesian equation. And you have to say, okay, we're going to let, you know, we're going to take the portion that's in quadrant one, or we're going to let x go from whatever, zero to two, or whatever it is. It's a little bit harder to restrict it with Cartesian. Parametric, though, it's simple. Zero to pi over two, quarter circle. All right, you all try this one. So this one is the one going backwards. This is where we aren't given x and y, but we want to build x and y. So see if you can build, see if you can build it with what we've done. See if you can find the parametric equations doing what we've already done. Does it 
Say that again? Does it matter which one we're picking to sign the first time? As long as it gives you the right point, then it's fine. Let's see if you can do it. Anyone get it yet? You get it, Caesar? <laughs> what did you what did you Jeez. Is it X, X equals twelve sine? X equals twelve sine. And then uh, Y equals twelve cosine? Oh, twelve cosine. Perfect. Perfect. Alright, so when we looked at our prior examples, what, one thing we noticed was that when we switched sine and cosine, it changed the initial point. And the initial point moved to the upper part of the circle, so it stopped, started at the top. So we definitely want that. And if we want the radius to be 12, then we're just going to have to use that coefficient out in front of 12. That'll put us on a circle of radius 12. So that's definitely t equals 0. Let's double check that we're doing everything they say. So we're going to have our t, our x, and our y. So when t is 0, <coughs> sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so we're at 0, 12, so that's perfect. Plug in, say, pi over 2 and pi. If we plug in pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we're at 12, 0. And is that the direction they wanted us to go? And they said clockwise, so yeah, that's going to do it. And if we plug in pi, sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is negative 1, so 0, negative 12. So that's going to put us right down here when t is pi. So sure enough, there is our parametric curve, and that's our orientation. And orange is a terrible background color. They look the same. Should we make it green? So that's how parametric equations work. Let's go to the simplest type of curve that we're going to look at, a line. And these are the parametric equations for a line. So parametric equations for a line, the standard parametric equations, we have two linear functions. We have a linear function for x and a linear function for y. And a couple of extra features here. The slope is going to be b over a. So it's going to be the y. Look at the y component. Take the coefficient of t divided by the x component's coefficient of t. And then this point is a point on the line. It's easiest, I think. You can just memorize that those are the parametric equations for a line. It's fine. But I think it's easier if you start to think of this with vectors. 
And if you've never done vectors before, this red arrow there is a vector. It's a directed line segment. So it's a it's a, a arrow that connects an initial point with a terminal point. And the components of the vector are just the distance traveled to get from the initial point to the terminal point in the x direction in the y direction. So we have two vectors here. We are going to say that this vector v, that's a direction vector for that blue line. There's an infinite number of direction vectors for a line. You can have a short vector, you can have a long vector, you can have one in between, does not matter. Right? There's a lot of direction vectors. <coughs> We also have a point that's on the line. That's what this R0 represents, a point on the line. There's an infinite number of choices for R0. Doesn't matter which one you pick. So this R0 is basically acting like an origin for the line. It's going to correspond up here to t equals 0. Anyone have any idea what this point is going to correspond to in terms of t. Hold the thought for a second. So here is going to be the equation of our line. It's going to look, look a lot like a slope intercept form Cartesian equation. That's a vector equation. So it says take the initial vector that you know touches the line and then add v times t. So when you're adding vectors, if we were to add this r0 vector to this v vector, r0 plus v puts us right there. So this is how we will add vectors. The added vector is going to come right across this diagonal right there. And that is going to correspond to r0 plus v. To get r0 plus v, what t value am I plugging in? So the pink here, this is, this blue vector here is R0 plus V. That's going to plot this point right there. What T value do we plug in there to get to this? T equals 1. Right, so this is going to correspond to T equals 1. So that vector V is going to act like a ruler. It's going to t equals 0 to 1. There's t equals 1. The point plotted when t is 2 is going to be one more of them. It will be r0 plus 2v. If we want to plot the points in the middle here, we would have to use fractional t values. r sub 0 plus half v would put us right there. That would be t equals 1 half. T equals 2 is going to, we're going to take that twice, so that's going to be about T equals 2. And then in the other direction, if we go that same distance V, this direction, that's going to correspond to T equals negative 1. So this equation, as T moves through positive numbers, you're going to graph the right half of the line. And as T graphs negative, as, as we plug in negative T values there, we're going to graph the left half. OK, so let's, let's go through this vector addition for a second. So if we wanted to add r0 plus vt, the way we do that, the way you add vectors and multiply by scalars is this. So we have x0, y0. And if we multiply this second vector by t, what we do is take the t and we share it with, with each component. We distribute it. And then when you add vectors, you add the corresponding components. So we're going to add the x's and get x0 plus a t. And then we're going to add the y's and get that. So notice this. Parametric equation, x0 plus a t x coordinate with a vector usually we use the word component instead of coordinate x component x naught plus at y naught plus bt y naught plus bt 
So parametric equations and vector valued functions are the same. Parametric, you have them broken apart according to like a system. And if you write it as a vector, we call this a vector valued function. So vector valued function just means every time you plug in a T, you get out a vector. And so you should be seeing like an array of arrows pointing to your line. So the graph of a vector valued function is the collection of all those tips. Each vector, the, we have an initial, some initial point and the terminal point. The initial point for us is always the origin. The terminal point is right there. The graph of this vector valued function is just that line. So let's try one. So here, we've got our parametric equations for a line. And we can do this two ways. You can just memorize the parametric form of a line. Or you can approach it like vectors. I would approach it like vectors. I think it's a little easier. So if we want to graph this parametric curve, we could say that the initial point on the line is what? What would happen if we plug in, uh, doesn't matter, we can plug in any t value we want as the initial point, but t equals zero is the natural choice. So what would be the r sub zero if we plug in t equals zero? Yeah, zero, negative four. Okay, and when we go to graph this, let's try to put two, do two things at once here. So if we're graphing, we're going to think about uh, 0, negative 4 is down here. There's our point. And now we need the slope. And the slope, one way to get the slope is to look at the y t coefficient divided by the x t coefficient. So the slope is going to be 3 divided by 2. So that says we're going to go up 3 over 2. There we go. So there is the line. So we can start with the 0, negative 4, and then figure out the slope from the two individual slopes. That's one way. All right, let's do it another way. So another way is to say, let's eliminate the t and graph the Cartesian equation. So let's build the Cartesian equation. So if we want to build the Cartesian equation, what, how are you going to solve that system and eliminate the t? What's, your, what's the easiest way? Equals x over two. Perfect. Yeah, divide by 2. So we're going to say t is x halves. We're going to plug that in down below. And that's going to give us y equals 3 over 2 times x minus, a fourth, uh, minus 4. So there is our Cartesian equation. We know how to graph that Cartesian equation very easily. This is corresponding to t equals 0 here. If we plug in a 1, we're going to get 2 comma negative 1. So this is corresponding to t equals 1. That tells us that the orientation is going to be up to the right. Am I looking at the slope of the groups of that? Or? Yeah. Because the slope is 3 over 2, and both were positive. So that means positive in both directions, which will move us up to the right. OK, so can you see what the vector is for v? So let's see if we can finish off both concepts. So a direction vector for this line. So if we look back up here, 
the direction vector is AB, and A and B are those coefficients of T, so that's going to be the vector 2 comma 3. That is the vector that uh, is right here. That is vector B. So 2 comma 3 says go 2 in the x direction and go 3 in the y direction. About the vector? Let's do another, let's do another one with just vectors. So let's do one with just vectors. Um, actually, we'll do one with just vectors in one minute. In one minute, because it'll be more obvious when we get to something that's a line segment instead of a full line. It'll be a little bit more obvious. So we'll, we'll let's do it in a minute. We'll do it in one minute. Okay, so let's do one more regular system here. So we have y equals 3t minus 3. We have x equals negative t plus 6. So right away we know it's a line. We know it's a line because each x component, x component is linear, y component is linear. They're both linear. So that means that that's one way to recognize that it'll be a line. So the, if we were going to think about vectors, let me just put them over here. We'll do a full vector one in a minute. R sub zero is what you get when you plug in zero. So that would be six comma negative three. V is going to be essentially slope. We're looking at the coefficients of x and y. Coefficient, or the coefficient of t for x and y is negative 1 and 3. So that's how those are going to come into play. <clears throat> All right, so let's put that off on the side. If we want to eliminate t, the easiest way here that I see is that, oh, let's multiply the top equation by 3. If we multiply the top equation by 3, then what happens when we add the two equations together? The t's will cancel. If you add those, if you multiply the top equation by 3 and then add, on the left, we're going to have 3x plus y. And on the right, we're going to have 15. And if we solve for y, there is our Cartesian equation in slope-intercept form. That we know how to graph. So let's go ahead and graph it. So this tells us that we are going to be at negative 15, let's see, where are we at? Uh, 15 is the y-intercept. So we're up here at 15, not to scale necessarily. How about the x-intercept? Five. Five. So I'll be over here. And so this line is going to come like that. So there it is. Now if we want to know the orientation, we need to know the direction of increasing t. So let's just notice that when t is 0, we are at 6, negative 3. So t equals 0 is right about here. 6, negative 3. If we were to plug in a 1, we'd be at 5, comma, 0. So t equals 1 is going to correspond to that x-intercept right there. So that tells us that the orientation is up left. That'll be the orientation. So now if we wanted to think about this as vectors, what we're thinking is this. r sub 0 is going to point to... 6, negative 3. So here is the vector r sub 0 pointing right there. That is vector r sub 0. Vector v says go left 1 and up 3. There is going to be vector v right there. So vector v is always going to be the vector between t equals 0 and t equals 1. 
All right, any questions on eliminating T? Primary thing right now is eliminate T in graph. All right, let's take a break. And then we'll do some lines, do some more lines after the break. Okay, so let's talk about a situation that's a little bit more common, which is trying to parametrize, in other words, find a parametric representation of a line segment, not an entire line, but a line segment. <coughs> so these types of parametrizations are definitely much easier to do with the vector approach. So let's see if we can do it with the vector approach right from the start. So this says that we want to parametrize the segment that starts at 0, 0 and ends at 2, 8. So we're going to think of the vector r sub 0 as the vector that, that points to the initial point. So it's just going to point to the origin, from the origin. So it's very short. <laughs> and then the direction vector, so this is the initial vector, and this is the direction. I'm going to have to move that, I think. So what we are going to do to find the direction vector is do q minus p. And so what that means is that we're going to look at our two points, we're going to take the initial point, and we're going to subtract it off from the terminal point. So we're going to say, okay, the x value at q, the terminal point is 2, 2 minus 0 is going to be in this position, and then 8 minus 0 is in the second position. So this vector, 2 comma 8, is going to point us from 0, 0 to 2, 8. So let's just look at a picture of this. So our idea then is that 0, 0 is the origin, 2 comma 8 is up here somewhere, and so we can write the vector 2 comma 8 is right there, the ordered pair that's at the end of the vector is the ordered pair 2 comma 8. So the vector 2 comma 8 is just an arrow from the origin that points to 2 comma 8, the point. So if we want to parametrize, so this is vector v, and vector r sub 0 is just the origin. <clears throat> so if we want to parametrize this, all we have to do is say that r will equal initial vector plus tv. Or vt. I think this book writes it as vt. So it, obviously, commutative law of multiplication applies, so it doesn't really matter. <coughs> But if we write it like that, it looks a lot like slope-intercept form. R sub 0 acts like the y-intercept. V acts like the slope. So let's do this with the R0 and the V that we have. So R0 is just the origin. So that's this initial vector. And then we've got our T vector, excuse me, our V vector, which is 2, 8 multiplied by T. And when we add vectors together, we just add component by component. So this is going to be 0 plus 2t. This t gets distributed to each component. So we'll have 0 plus 2t and 0 plus 8t. So here is our parametrization. Right there. If you wanted to write it in parametric form, you would say x is 2t and y is 8t. So you can write it in vector form, you can write it in parametric form, both mean the same exact thing. Now we need to know what the t interval is. What is the t interval? Let's see, where is our first t value? 0. 
And what about our last t value? One? If we plug in one, we'll be at two eight. So we wanted to go from zero, zero to two eight. And if you use this process to get the direction vector, notice the direction vector goes all the way from zero, zero to two eight. So we only need one of them to get all the way to two eight. If you do your parameterization this way, your interval will always be zero to one. Now, do you see that there are lots of other ways to do this. So for example, we could parameterize the line this way. This will parameterize the same exact line if we just divide out the two. But what would be the interval for t if we wanted to get that line segment from 0, 0 to 2, 8? Yeah, 0 to 2. <coughs> So there's going to be lots of param uh, parameterizations. Totally depends. The standard one is usually parameterizing from 0 to 1. But it, equally valid are those. All right, you all try this one. See if you can parameterize this from P to Q. Your R sub 0 will be that. So your first goal is to figure out what V is. And again, I'll put it up here, V is Q minus B. Do we get the parameterization? Close? What do you all get for Q minus P? Wait. 7 and minus 13. Everyone get that? Right? Okay, so then if we want to build our vector function, we're going to start with the r sub 0, and then we're going to add our direction vector times t. So there it is written as a line, right? It looks like a line. <coughs> well, if we add the x's and add the y's, 
This is going to be our simplified vector form. But if we want to write it in parametric form, no sweat, all we do is break it apart. Then this will be our parametric form. And then we have to indicate what our interval is. And once again, if we use this method, it's always going to be 0 to 1. If you plug in t equals 0, you do in fact get negative 1, negative 3. But if you plug in 1, you are going to get 6 and negative 16. So that approach will always give you your segment parameterization on the interval 0 to 1. Not too bad. Now, if you don't want to deal with the vector stuff at all, then notice this. So here is your initial point. There's the negative 1, negative 3. And notice that this number right here, the 7, is coming from the x difference. And the negative 16 minus negative 3, that's going to be the y difference. See it? So the y difference is going to go in front here. The x difference is going to go in front there. If you wanted to bypass completely doing it in a vector form. I feel like it's easier to make mistakes doing it that way. But if you see it easily, then you can do it that way too. Did I highlight? I highlighted wrong here. I want to highlight those and highlight those. So 6 minus minus 1 is the 7 right here. And then those, we need different colors here. I need different colors. Let's get rid of that. Can I get rid of that color? Ooh. OK, so there's one. Ah, come on. There, oh my gosh, that one just disappeared. All right, there, now it's color coded. So subtract the x's to get the x coefficient of t of t. Subtract the y's to get the y, the coefficient of t for the y. So if you want to bypass the vectors altogether, you can do it that way. You want to graph it? You want to graph it? Could you? <laughs> Wait, graph these two points? I can graph it, I believe. Oh my gosh! I'm duped. Duped. Please don't break it. Right? So, should we do it to scale? No. <laughs> Alright, not to scale. So, Negative 1, negative 3, we're down here at t equals 0. And then 6, negative 16, so we're way down here. So we're talking about that line segment, and the orientation is this way. So this is, oh, well, it's just called Q. And P. Question? No. Good. Alright, time for calculus. Now we've got we've done with all the sort of intro how to graph the parametric curve. We always want to know slopes of tangent lines. We want calculus. We crave it. No. No. <laughs> no. Not happening? Come on. Okay. So derivatives when you're in parametric. Your dy dx still means the same thing. It means the slope of the tangent. But the way we find it is going to be a little bit different. <laughs> the way we find it is going to be taking the derivative of the y component and dividing it by the derivative of the x component. Okay, okay I think we can do this. So here we go. Calculus. I believe. I believe in calculus. <laughs> so there's our system. That's our parametric curve. 
Any idea what that curve is? Oval. Oval. <laughs> and in math, we call it an ellipse. <laughs> if you're in the grocery store, maybe call it an oval. But Not an orbit. <laughs> we call it, we call it an ellipse. <laughs> call it an ellipse. Now let's find our derivatives. Everybody agree with those derivatives? Right, just take the derivative with respect to t of both x and y. And then dy dx, all we do to get dy dx is put y prime over x prime. So it's going to be a cosine of t divided by a negative sine of t. So that is the derivative. But it looks a little weird because there's not any x, no x's. Right? Normally dy dx is x's. <coughs> so here's what we have to do. So to figure out what dy dx is at a particular t value, notationally we're going to use this notation. So dy dx at t equals pi over 2, we've got to somehow indicate that, and that's how we do it. And so now all we do is come in up here, and we're going to plug in pi over 2 for all the t's that we see. Cosine of pi over 2 is, oh, this is boring. So that slope is 0. What kind of tangent line is that? 0. Horizontal. Horizontal, please. Thank you. <laughs> zero t the tangent line is 0. The slope is 0. So we're going to have some sort of ellipse, and that's going to correspond to well, let's do it. Let's graph it. Let's graph it. So do you see that we want to isolate sine? So we're going to write the system of parametric equations that way. If we write them that way, if we write them that way, then we can use our identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So sine squared is going to be y squared over 64 plus x squared equals 1. So there is the equation of our ellipse. So if we want to graph this on a, in a Cartesian plane, the equation is going to, let's see, are you going to let me do this? So it's going to look something. It's going to look something like that, and the intercepts over here in the x direction. This is at one, and this is at square root of sixty-four is eight, so zero eight. So there's our ellipse. Question. And since we only have like a singular point for t, we don't have to worry about it doubling back on itself. That's right. So, we're, so we need to know where we are. So where are we when t is pi over 2? Because there's two possibilities, right, where we have a horizontal tangent. So we need to know where we are. So if we look up here, what is the corresponding x and y point when t is pi over 2? We would plug it in here. Well, let's do it with the table of values just because that's how we kind of have been doing it. So if we have t, x, and y, if we plug in pi over 2, plug it in right there, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Plug it in right there, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we're at 0, 8. So this point right here corresponds to t being pi over 2. And here is a perfect horizontal tangent. Yay! It's all, real, it's all making sense. Math is working. So what about, what do you think the t value is that's going to generate this point down there? Negative. 
So 3 pi over 2. Negative pi over 2 would also get to it, but we usually go positive. So 3 pi over 2. If we plug in 3 pi over 2 right here, go into our original. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so we get negative 8. So this is going to correspond to t equals 3 pi over 2. And once again, we'll get a horizontal tangent. So if we come up here to the derivative function, right there, if you plug in 3 pi over 2 right there, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, 0 divided by that is 0. So we're always going to have a Cartesian point that corresponds to a, to a t value. To a, um, a, a parameter value. Well, let's try out this thing. So here, there's our curve. That's our parametric curve. Parametric curve. We don't have to graph it. That's our parametric curve. We can find the derivative. The derivative system is very easy. Let's just call it x prime. Let's keep it simple. So there's x prime, there's y prime. And then dy dx is what it always is. It's the slope of the tangent. But it's weird because we have t's and no x's. So if we want to find the slope of the tangent at a t value, we'll do that. So we'll end up with 3 halves. So that is the slope of the tangent line. And this did you ask to find the equation of the tangent line? So any questions on finding the derivative? We, you, you just have to remember that it's y prime over x prime, which shouldn't be too hard. You know, the x's are in the denominator, like they always are, like for slope. So the t, that's what we'll plug in, the t that's given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the plug in the t that's given. <laughs> plug in the t that's given. That seems like a really easy problem. I know. Tell me why it isn't. This stuff's so easy. OK. Now this curve is a curve that I would not expect you to be able to draw. This little coat hanger curve looking thing. You do not have to be able to draw that. Right? Circles, lines, ellipses, basic things. Nothing too crazy. OK. So once again, let's go ahead and find our derivative system. So our derivative system. We take the derivative of the x component, we get 2t. We take the derivative of the y component, we get 3t squared plus 1. And once we have those derivatives, we combine them into a fraction, and that will give us our dy dx. So dy dx will be the y derivative divided by the x derivative. No. If your instinct is to do long division there, smack yourself. <laughs> don't, don't do long division there. And, right, because we just want to evaluate this. If, whenever we're evaluating something, we generally don't even need to simplify. So when t is 2, 4 times 3 is 12, plus 1 is 13 over 4. There is the slope of our tangent line. But now we have to figure out where we are. Where is that tangent line? So let's look at the curve. When t is equal to 2, where are we on the curve? What is x and what is y? X. And what is y? So that is where we are in the curve. We are right at this point right there. And our tangent line is like that. So there's our tangent line with slope 13 fourths. Jordan, you look very disturbed. 
Why is uh, x 3? Because 4 minus 1 is 3. Okay. So we're going to take the 2, plug it in here, and square it and get 4, subtract 1. Okay, so we're not so we're plugging it into the, if we want to know where we are, the original parametric equations are telling us where we are at time t. Right? The, that's what these equations tell us. They tell us the point on the curve for a particular t value. So if you plug in t equals 0, where are we? When we plug in t equals 0, we're at negative 1 comma 0. So t equals 0 would be right down here. So if we plug in any t value, it will correspond to a point on the line. Do you see what the slope of the tangent is when t is 0? Right? We have a vertical tangent. So if the denominator is 0 in the derivative, but the numerator is a constant, that means we have a vertical tangent. So if we were asked, this would be a vertical tangent right here. So if we did dy dx at 0, we plug in 0 here. We have 1 divided by 0. This does not exist. This corresponds to a vertical tangent. Friend us. Make sense? <laughs> okay. Let's try another one. Let's try it. Unless someone has a question on that. I won't really understand until I go home and take a nap. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Oh, I know that feeling. There's lots of math floating around in my brain, but yeah. it's not. It's not all connected yet. No. It will coalesce into a beautiful image. All right, this is a curve you would not be expected to be able to graph, right? Not one that we can eliminate t very easily. But we can do math, we can do calculus on it very easily. So we can create our derivative system. So the derivative x prime, that's going to be an e to the t. And the derivative of y, that's going to be 1 over t plus 1. So there's our derivative system. From the derivative system, we can go ahead and find dy dx. That's going to be y prime over x prime. When we do that division, we'll have that as our dy dx form. And then they're saying, what, what, is, what is the derivative at t equals 0? So we're going to plug in t equals 0, and it looks like we get 1. All right, any issues up to that point? Yeah? That didn't sound like a question. The <laughs> <laughs> question was, what? <laughs> I heard like a grunting noise. So we get our derivative system at t equals 0. We plug in a 0 there, a 0 there. We get 1. Is that part OK? So now the next question is, where are we? To figure out where we are, we're going to do our table of values business. So when t is 0, we plug in here. e to the 0 is 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. So this tells us this is where we are. And the slope of that tangent line is 1. <laughs> Does that make sense? You're good? You're with us? My brain is shutting down right now. All right, we better go fast then. So what about if we wanted the equation of this tangent line? So equation of a line. It's y-intercept. We could use slope-intercept form, but usually it's faster to do point-slope in general. Point-slope, we do y minus 0 equals the slope times x minus 1. 
<laughs> yeah, that. Points, points, point slope formula. So there is the tangent line equation. Do you agree with that? So the equation of a line? Still an important thing. Yeah, man. Gotta find the equation of a line. Gotta be able to find the equation of a line. Let's do something harder to wake you up. <laughs> so arc length. Arc length. Hopefully you remember. Anyway, sounds familiar. So arc length, if you remember back when we had functions, regular functions. <laughs> way back in time. Way back in time. So way back in time. That was our arc length formula from chapter two. Whatever. First test. First exam. The exam that you started reviewing already. <laughs> so that's so that that is the old arc length formula. But now we have these parametric curves, there's two. So what we're gonna do, they introduced two whole new letters, which I think is kind of like silly. This is gonna be our new arc length formula. X prime squared, y prime squared, both inside the square root. So instead of a one and a y prime squared, it's an x prime squared and a y prime squared. And so the, this all went back to, if you look back in your notes, the, if we had a curve and we're trying to find the arc length along it, what we did was created, so we did this back in that chapter long ago. There's dx, there's dy, and ds is the hypotenuse of that differential triangle. The actual arc length goes along here. And that actual arc length is delta s. So this is the arc length. That's the exact arc length. And it's approximately equal to ds. And so what we have to do then, we don't know how to do anything. We don't know how to integrate with respect to s because these limits are t limits. So what we had to do was take this ds and plug it in there. And the way we got that, remember, which is a little different, but same, 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 but different. If we multiply by one here, and then we take the square root of both sides, we go from there to here, and then we replace the ds with that. And that'll give us our arc length. So let's try it. Let's try it all together now. First, let's find our derivative system. What is x prime? Three. I'm not going with that. Y prime? Four. Four. We're flying. We're on the runway, at least we're on the runway. Maybe we're not flying yet. Okay, zero to two, and then square root, x prime squared, y prime squared, dt. Square root of 25 is five. Integral, zero to two, dt. What is the value of this integral? It's the length of the interval because you're integrating just dt? Yeah, it's just length of the interval. 2 minus 0 is 2. Integral of dt is t. Plug in 2, plug in 0. So there's our 10. That's it? So since this is for a range of t values, do we have to do anything to check that the function doesn't double back on itself? Great question. So this is a line right there. And so technically speaking, like in Calc 3, you will do that. And the way that you would do that <clears throat> to show that this parametric curve doesn't double back on itself, you would show that the derivative is never 0 on the interval. 
So when you take the derivative here, you get 3 and 4, and that's never 0. So if you took the derivative and you had t values in here, let's suppose your derivative was 3t and 4t, then you would have to say, oh gosh, when t is 0, it's not differentiable because both, both x prime and y prime are 0. So you have to be careful, in Calc 3 you'll do that. And the way you do it is just to make sure the derivative is never 0 on the interval. In this class, we won't. In this class, we won't do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can bypass that complexity, luckily. Okay, let's try it again. So, somebody tell me what x prime is equal to. Zero is three for now. X prime is negative three sine, sine of t. Yeah, negative three sine, sine of t. So we're taking our x function, our x component function, differentiating it with respect to t, and then how about y prime? 3 cosine t. So that's our derivative system. And then our arc length, which we can use an L, we can use whatever letter we want. We're going to integrate. So here, here they're really asking us for the perimeter of the circle. So they're saying, what if we integrate from 0 to 2 pi? Then we're going to have square root x prime squared is 9 sine squared. y prime squared is 9 cosine squared. So we get that. Why don't we just do 2 pi r? And then sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So this is all going to reduce to the square root of 9. Square root of 9 is 3. Integral 0 to 2t of dt is 2 pi. So we'll get 6 pi. Which, of course, is 2 pi r. Yeah, OK. Can I just do that on the top of this? This question is not on the test. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We would have what that symbols. <laughs> Is that reassuring? No. I'm not talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And each step there you want me to clarify? So you're just squaring inside the square root. Square the each derivative. Okay. Add them together. Sift out the sine squared plus cosine squared. Factor it out. All right, here's another one. So let's see if we can do this together. What is the derivative of x prime? What is the derivative of x? Negative sine. Negative sine. Minus cosine. All right. And then let's do the derivative of y. So y prime. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. So here we'll have minus sine plus cosine. <clears throat> so then the arc length L from 0 to pi. Well, at least we have one number on the screen. Zero. All these letters. Well, that's ominous. <laughs> so we have to square. We have to square each other. We have to do this thing that in algebra they called it foiling. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it. Well, that is not an adjective or an adverb. Was it adverb? Adverb, but it's L Y. Uh, foiling. Adverb. Foily. Yeah, it's a verb. Foily. Foily. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, so we can foil. We can foil. Most of us can foil. I can, but I don't want to. 
All right, negative sine times negative sine. Sine squared. Okay, now the hard part, the middle term. So when we're foiling here, the middle term is going to be two times A times B. So A is this, B is this. Multiply those together, you get sine times cosine, and then you double it, so you get two sine cosine. And then when you square cosine or square negative cosine, you get cosine squared. All right, so there's the first one all foiled out. Second one foiled out, negative sine times negative sine is sine squared. We'll just put it down here so it fits. Middle term, negative 2 sine t cosine t. Plus cosine squared of t. So 2, 0, 2. So we end up with some cancellation. Positive 2 sine t cosine t, negative 2 sine t cosine t. And then sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. And we have two of them. So lo and behold, all that equals 1. We end up with that. Oh, OK. Everybody agree? Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So this is going to end up being square root of 2 times pi. There is our arc length. So in this case, we were finding half the circumference of that circle. But the radius is still square root of 2. The radius is, uh, the radius is square root of 2, right? Stop talking. <laughs> Stop talking. That's your check. That's how you check it. I'm going to give you an assert. I'll give you an ellipse because I know you don't know the arc length of an ellipse. Google. Is that what we're doing? Is, <laughs> is that what we were finding? Right. In this particular case, but i well, maybe I. So if this is your ellipse. And that's 3, and that's 2. We talked about the area of the ellipse, but we don't know the arc length of the ellipse. <laughs> I'll put that on there. Please. OK, let's do polar coordinates. Polar coordinates is our last topic. Polar coordinates sound familiar? Do they sound familiar when they're combined? No. Polar coordinates? Not polar plunge? All right, polar coordinates, our last topic. Holy smokes. Let's go. OK, so polar coordinates, we, yeah, once again, we say, well, why do we need a whole other coordinate system? Well, because there's a whole bunch of curves that can't be described easily with Cartesian that can be described easily with polar. Um, so the first thing, let's look at this triangle first, because these four equations all come from that triangle. Sine, cosine, and tangent of theta. Sine of theta is y over r multiplied by r. Cosine of theta is x over r multiplied by r. Tangent of theta is y over x. Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So the, a polar point, we have a radial distance, which is the hypotenuse, and we have a counterclockwise rotation, which is theta. So all four of those equations are all the four possibilities for a triangle. Sine, cosine, and tangent of theta, and then the Pythagorean theorem. So it's those four equations that naturally arise from a right triangle. And so the question then, the first question we want to ask is this. We have these two new variables, r and theta. What do the graphs of them look like? So for example, when you go back to college algebra, or before college algebra, pre-algebra, whatever it's called, algebra 1 or 0 or 2, <laughs> when you are graphing in the xy plane, you have two variables. You have an x and you have a y. And you ask yourself, what does the graph of each of those coordinate variables equal to a constant look like? 
What is the graph of x equals 2? Oh, vertical line. What's the graph of y equals negative 3, horizontal line? So we want to do the same kind of thing here. We want to say, well, what about if these are two new coordinate variables, what, a, what is r, equals a, r equal a constant look like? What does theta equal a constant look like? So we want to graph those. So before we graph them, let's make sure that we understand how you find the point in the plane. So if we have r comma theta, let's suppose theta is pi over 3 and r is 2. Then we go to pi over 3 and we go out to 2. And that's the point. Over here, what we see is that there are infinite representations of any point in polar. Because you can always start spinning around and adding multiples of 2 pi. So you can come up with co-terminal angles that put you on the same terminal ray. All right, so usually we don't do that, but you could. Now if theta is, let's say theta is, again, pi over 3, let's just suppose. If r is positive, we go out into quadrant 1 if r is positive. But here is the weird contrarian part of polar. You can have a negative r value. So normally we think about the r value as representing radius. I will call it a radial value because it can be negative. So I don't want it to necessarily always you to always think radius. So if the r value is negative and you have a theta value of pi over 3, you just jump into the opposite quadrant. Hop, skip, jump, whatever you want to think. Just take that point and jump it 180 degrees away. Okay. Keep that on the back burner. So now we know how to find these points. What if we want to graph r equals a... Oh, it's on the next slide. I won't write it. So we'll graph r equals a constant, and we'll graph theta equals a constant. But think in your mind for a second. If r is 2, if you want to graph the equation r equals 2, that tells you that r is 2 no matter what theta is. So as long as you're two units from the origin, your theta can be anything. So r equals 2 is going to be a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin because you want all the r values of 2, and if theta is not in the equation, it's unrestricted. Like, let's go back to Cartesian for a minute. If you have x equals 2, the reason the graph is a vertical line is because there's no y in the equation, so y has no restriction on it. The equation builds the restriction. So if you say x is 2, that means x has to be 2 you're restricting the x's to be only those points where x is 2. And there's no y in the equation, so y can be anything. So you go to the x equals 2 spot, and you go up and down as far as you can go, because there's no y in the equation, so y is unrestricted. Same idea here. If we go r equals a constant, there's no theta, so we give, get a full circle. Similarly, if theta equals a constant, we're going to get a full line. Because if theta is a constant, say theta is pi over 3. Well, all the positive r values will take you out that way, and the negative r values will take you down the other way. So you will get a full line when theta is a constant. OK, so these four equations, they're just summarizing those four equations there. Sine, cosine, tangent of theta, and then the Pythagorean. And let's try. Somebody pick a point. C. C? Other than C. D. D. No, not D. E. E. Let's go with D. Let's go with D. So D I don't want to pick just because it's a quadrantal point. Let's pick a, a point that's a little more complex. And picking E or something, C is in quadrant one, so something outside of quadrant one just to generalize it a little bit. Okay, so... E. There are many ways to represent E. So here's how we're going to do it. So the standard representation of E, so we're going to do R comma theta. Standard representation, we are going to rotate, you know, standard rotation counterclockwise from there to here, and then we're going to go out that distance. 
So that point is two units from the origin in this polar paper. So the, be the normal, normal, the standard representation is going to be r is 2, and theta is, let's see, 3 pi over 3 plus 1 more pi over 3 is 4 pi over 3. So that's our standard polar representation, a positive r, a positive theta. Do you care if it's in the degrees or radians? If they give you angles in radians, your angle should be in radians. They give you your angle in degrees, it should be in degrees. I can't think of a single time we've used degrees in this class. There's a reason for that. <laughs> Let's not get into it, though. Why? When you take the derivative of sine and get cosine, that is contingent on having radians. Right? Because radian is a, is a unitless number. Right? Radians are unitless. Does that make sense? Radians are unitless? When you find the radian angle, you do S divided by R, so the units of length cancel with the units of length. So a radian is unitless. If you were to put degrees inside of your sine function, when you take the derivative, technically you would have to then use a chain rule because the angle inside is not a pure number, it is, it's a degree number, which would then have to be converted to radians. So, but anyway, let's not talk about that. So you use radians for a reason, and it has to do with derivatives. So let's come up with another way to represent E. Negative 2 pi over 3. Perfect. Negative 2 pi over 3. So if we go to the pi over 3 angle right there, the point is not in this quadrant. It's down there. So we want to jump or hop or skip, whatever your fancy is. We want to get to the opposite quadrant, so we choose a negative r value. All right. How about if we choose a positive r and a negative theta? What would the negative theta be? What would the negative theta be? So if we rotate this way, what would that angle be? Which is? My brain's not working. Negative 2 pi over 3. Yeah. Everyone agree with that? So negative pi over 3 would plop you right there, and then a negative pi over 3, second negative pi over 3 would take you over there. Now, if we want to be hyper contrarian, which I know that's important for some of you, how could we choose a negative r value and a negative theta value? Negative r and negative theta. So negative, r, negative theta means we're going this way, but we need to stop right there if we want to also have a negative r value. So that's going to be negative 3 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, 5 pi over 3. So negative 5 pi over 3. That makes sense? So we're going to go clockwise until we're exactly opposite. I like the first one. <laughs> Very wow. Straightforward. That's shocking to hear from you. I know. <laughs> Mr. Minus C. I don't know what's talking about. <laughs> OK, so let's take a look at converting points. So this point is given in polar. So 1 comma 2 pi over 3 on this polar paper, there is 1 comma 2 pi over 3, right there. Changing to Cartesian is super easy. Changing to Cartesian is just plug and chug with our two primary equations. So our two primary equations are these two. Those are our two primaries. If you know r and you know theta, you plug them in right there to get x. You plug them in right there to get y. So let's see, what is our ordered pair? If we plug in a 1 for the radius, cosine of 2 pi over 3 is cosine of 2 pi over 3. Wow. <laughs> Not feeling impressed? It's negative 1 half. 
my calculator says. Your calculator! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I have failed. <laughs> I have failed. Or just tired. Tired, tired. Oh, yeah. Okay, 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4 is right here, but then we're going to go to negative 4, so we're way out here. So that is negative 4, 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4 is that angle right there. Okay, but again, when we are going from polar, it's super easy because you just have to plug right into this formula. We're just going to plug into this pair of equations. So we're thinking about r is negative 4, cosine of 3 pi over 4. Cosine of, without a calculator, <laughs> cosine, cosine of 3 pi over 4 is in quadrant 2. <laughs> Negative root 2 over 2, thank you. Oh my gosh. So, so we're going to have negative 4 times negative root 2 over 2, comma, negative 4 times sine of 3 pi over 4, positive root 2 over 2. So there will be our point. If we simplify it, it looks like it's going to be 2 root 2, negative 2 root 2, which lines up with our picture right there. So the coordinate should make sense. <laughs> yes, it should okay. make sense. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. All right, I think we need to stop yeah. before somebody starts bleeding out of their eye. <laughs> okay. Joshua. <laughs> it looks like you're about to fall over in your chair. <laughs> You can sit here and stare at it as long as you need to process it. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday for our final big week. I will have your exams on Monday, obviously. Exams on Monday. I always need a weekend.